Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the session on trees um, and the future of forests, opportunities and threats. Um, I'm Lawrence Shaw. I'm the Lead Historic Environment Advisor at Forestry England, and I'll be running this session today with my colleague David Robertson, who's just currently getting his laptop booted up, uh, who is the Lead Historic Environment Advisor for Forestry Commission. Um, so obviously we've got two, we come from two counterparts, David very much overseeing policy, strategy, advice, um, government, EIAs and UK forestry standards, and myself working with the public forest estate, the nation's forest. So what, what we deal with about creating, but what, what, how we deal with the archaeology founds within our forests. Um, the session today is going to work by David providing a quick um, overview of, of forestry and the threats and the opportunities. Um, and then we've got a fantastic panel um, who will introduce, uh, Dave will introduce at the end of his, his presentation. And we are going to take you on a lovely tour of um, the, the sort of perhaps preconceived threats and preconceived opportunities and perhaps open some minds in terms of what the opportunities or the un unidentified threats might be with regards to forestry and archaeology. So um, really excited. With regards to the discussion we, ha we, we will have with these guys, um, one thing we will encourage is that we want your input as well. So if you, if you hear something that we've said that really irks you or you, you think we completely omitted something, then put your hand up and we will come to you and ask you to pitch that to us and we'll, we'll try and respond as best we can. Um, how are you doing, David? We've tried to be really brave and have a, um, a poll halfway through, which obviously the best laid plans. Right. Yeah, apologies. We we tried to be a little bit flash, tried to be brave and embed the results of our poll on a slide and the software's not working. So fingers crossed that will be loaded up by the time we, we need it. So um, as Lauren said, I'm going to start um, as off just with a, a quick overview to try and start what I hope is going to be a conversation. And we're going to start that with poll. Um, so if you're able to, at some point over the next five minutes or so, it would be great if you could fill this, this poll in for us. Um, we've got the URL on the screen at the top. Hopefully that is big enough for you to read. Um, we've got the QR code. Um, I know from earlier trying it, my phone wouldn't scan. Well, that would be a great picture. Um, everyone with their phones up. Um, scan that QR code if you can. It's a um, Microsoft form. It's anonymous. It's just a, a way of us finding out, get, sort of testing the room at the start to find out what your views on forestry and archaeology are. Um, you know, do you think it's a threat? Do you think it's an opportunity? Do you think it's a bit of both? Or are you not sure? You've got all those different options to, to choose. And what we'll do is we will run the poll again at the end to see if anyone has changed their mind, see, see if the collective view has, has changed. So, so what, what we'd like while you're doing the poll, what we'd like today to is to be the start of a conversation or rather a continuation of a conversation, a conversation that's been going on for, for many years. I think at CIFA, um, Elaine Willett and I, we organised a session in 2022 called In Our Nature and see if this is a follow on from that. Uh, there, was, there was conversations at last year's CIFA as well. And some of us will have been in the Good Natured Progress session this morning. This is very much a, a continuation of that. And I'm hoping the conversation will go on beyond today in the soon to be formed CIFA Landscape Special Interest Group, which if you're interested, has its first AGM on the 8th of May. Um, hopefully I'm away on that day so I won't be going but hopefully um, other people lots of other people will um, so to set the scene for the future of forestry in the UK um, forestry I would argue is one of the UK's most heavily regulated land uses and I'm aware when I give this talk I'm going to give a quite a few political statements contentious statements and that might be one of them from from the start um, we have forestry acts that cover all parts of the UK these form the they're listed on the screen and they form the legal, the legal framework for felling trees, including the need for felling licenses to fell growing trees. Um, they outline the roles of the forest authorities, the different forest authorities in the four nations of, of the UK. But we also have 
EIA regulations across all parts of the UK as well. And again, listed in three, three different regulations listed there. And these are separate from agricultural EIAs. They're separate from planning EIAs. And it's important to say the Forestry Act is separate from the national planning policy framework. Forestry sits outside its, its remit. Um, EIA regulations cover afforestation, deforestation, forest roads, and quarries. Um, and we also have a series of standards and guidance working for um, Forest Services, part of Forestry Commission England. I'm always banging on, and many of you have heard me talking about the UK forestry standard, always talking about it. So the government's approach to sustainable forestry it outlines the legal requirements and, and good practice. Um, it establishes the historic environment as one of the eight main important elements of, of forestry. And we're currently on edition, edition four, um, but only at the moment, because on the 1st of October, we're going to move on to edition five. And there isn't too much change in terms of requirements and good practice for the historic environment, but quite a bit of re restructuring, I would say. So, so make yourselves familiar with UKFS edition five if, if you work in the forestry sector. Um, many land managers, forest managers also choose to sign up for the UK Woodland Assurance Standard. It's a certification standard for sustainable woodland management, which does have sections on cultural and historic features and sites. Um, so another, another protection measure. And in some parts of the UK, we have country guidance. Um, this explains how the UK forestry standard applies in each particular country. Um, they've been in place in Scotland for, for quite some time, and I've put two examples on, on the screen, um, one for information and advice and one for, for rig and furrow. Um, but also, I'm delighted to announce at this conference today at midnight, um, while some of us were still at pre-conference drinks, um, England's country guidance was published. Um, if you do an internet search for historic environment guidance for forestry in England, England, you should find it. Um, it didn't work that search yesterday, but it did work this morning. So it is up there for you to, to find. There's a draft, draft version of it on the screen. And I'll just take this opportunity to say thank you for ev to everyone who's helped in the development of that. It's been three years work. Um, I haven't counted how many, but at least I'd say 50 different people and multiple organizations, um, some of which are in this room. So thank you. So why um, did we say in our description of, the suggestion of, of this session, why did we suggest forestry would play a play in British society, arguably, than it has since the Forestry Commission woodland expansions of the 1920s and 30s? Um, well, this is why we're here, why we're here to talk about it. Um, the government has set very, very ambitious tree planting targets, which will have an impact on us as archaeologists. There is, there is um, those targets across the UK, I've, I've popped on the screen, apologies, I don't have them for Northern Ireland on the screen, but, but for three nations, they are, are there for you to take away and, and digest, along with some recent woodland planting in, in, the, in the Peak District with Mam Tor in the, in the distance. Um, we have funding available to plant trees. Um, businesses are looking to invest in nature-based schemes that offset their carbon emissions. Um, there's a higher demand for timber as a building material than there has been for a very, very long time. And as we heard about in the session this morning, we're suffering significant biodiversity loss and woodland offers one of the options to, to counter that. Um, in England, our ambitions are outlined in the England Trees Action Plan and the Environmental Improvement Plan from 2023 that Elaine mentioned earlier in, in the session this morning. Um, the background behind all of this is climate change and a desire to counteract its effects. Um, Elaine talked about some of the, the issues, climate change issues earlier, and some of them are on the screen there. They're well known. I'll, I'll let you read them for your, yourselves. Um, but tied into the desire to counteract climate change is the push for, for net zero. In England, we're looking for net zero by, by 2050. We're looking to reduce our greenhouse gases, gas emissions to as close to zero as possible, and for the remaining emissions to be absorbed through natural sinks like like trees. Um, 2050 is the target in, in England, and given we've had publicity in the last few weeks, I think it's 2045 in Scotland, the target for net zero. 
You might wonder what this has to do with archaeology, all of us in this room. Um, so I'd argue as a profession, we've, we have had a major role in forestry for the last 30 or so years, but that's, increase, that's increasing and it's going to continue to increase. We've got a key role to play. Um, we're really important in supplying information and the example I've used on, on the screen is the Woodland Opportunities Map for Wales um, with on that screen the hatched areas being historic environment features, the orange areas being um, registered parks and gardens and the brown areas being scheduled monuments. A really useful online data source. In England we're developing our nas national historic environment data sets for Woodland Project, trying to bring more data sets to, to, to being publicly accessible. Um, we're also heavily involved in advice, but, but our role in advice is, is increasing. And I've got some figures for the England Woodland Creation offer here. So in 2021, the Forest Commission in England had 296 applications to UCO, its flagship scheme. In 2022, we had 435. In 2023, we had 557. And every single one of those would have had a historic environment record search and historic environment advice. Um, another grant scheme that we have, the Woodland Creation, um, the Woodland Creation Planning Grant, um, sometimes does require archaeological survey as part of developing projects for woodland creation. About 10% of those projects have funded funded archaeological surveys. So not a huge number, but there are surveys out there happening. And we've got key roles to play in protecting, managing archaeological sites and transmitting their importance through training and engagement and communication. And we've got two of Lawrence's wonderful pictures on the screen, a uh, laser scan of a house, a medieval house in the Lake District, and a drawing, a painting of a stone row in Dartmoor. 